just love worshiping God together. I love the presence of God. Amen. I love what God does in our lives. Amen. So good to have all of you here today. It's good to have Nathan arrive last night. Nathan and Trina and uh, Lexi, of course, are with us. Amen. It's good to have Ted back from the Philippines. And uh, it's good to have all of you here. Everybody say it's good to be here. And, uh, and I've got my voice back. I don't know if you noticed that. Last week I could hardly speak. So it was, uh, it was kind of more of a tentative message on my part. Maybe not in power and anointing of, the, of uh, the Word of God, but at least from my voice anyway. So I'm happy with that. I'm happy I got my voice back. And uh, now I can shout, yell, emphasize. You know, all of that. Amen. Amen. I've got to find my glasses. Oh, oh, never mind. got them in my pocket. I always get them a little lost whenever I don't have a pocket on my shirt. And I put stuff everywhere else except where it needs to be. And, uh, amen. Look around and say, you sure look good today. Tell your neighbor. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are uh, rapidly approaching Christmas, of course, and I told you last week, Sunday, I was going to preach a series of messages that will kind of lead us into Christmas. And, and so all of the messages, well, last week and this week and also next week, uh, will be from the Christmas message in that area of passage of Scripture. Uh, preached last week on the light. Let some light into your life. Amen. There are so many dark areas of our lives that we just need God's light of His Word to shine inside and make the changes that are needed. Am I a little quiet? I am. Can you turn me up a little bit back there? Just a wee bit. Amen. That'll be the red one so I get me up here as well. Feel, yeah, there we go. Now I can hear myself. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And if it gets too loud, you can always uh, just kind of go talk to Josh and maybe he can turn me down a bit. But at least this way I won't feel like I have to strain my voice and maybe lose it halfway through. Isn't God good? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just, I'm just amazed. Over the last little while I've had... Uh, uh, just a number of things happen. I've had uh, uh, people in my life call and, and ask me to, uh, to join together with them. And uh, I'm just thrilled with, uh, with those that are around me. And that's not anybody in this church, just to join together with them. And, uh, and I'm, it's great when we're all approaching God and what God wants to do the same way. And that we are in one mind and one accord as far as the direction of God for a church and for our lives as well. And I'm just so thankful. To I'm thankful for the family of God, aren't you? Right. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just uh, so grateful for all that God has done and is doing. So Luke chapter 1, verses. Uh, we're going to read verses 26 through 38. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through uh, 38. I know it's quite a lengthy passage of Scripture. Also, um, you'll notice that this passage has to do with the birth of Jesus, or at least prior to it. And so we are working our way towards that, uh, that day. And honestly, everybody, every day should be a celebration of Jesus' uh, birth and His life inside of you. Um, the fact that we choose to set aside this time of year to make it special. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's a good thing. For at least for a little while, the world will stop everything else and uh, maybe stop fighting and stop fussing and, and uh, stop being angry at everybody. And just for a little while, there will be a little peace and joy in, uh, in our world. And I know that's not going to be a lasting thing except in those that love God and have God in their lives. But at least for a little while, maybe they'll feel the touch of God and be drawn to it. Everybody said Amen. 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 So Luke chapter 1 verses 26 and we're going to read through to verse uh, 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried 
to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. I want to preach to you for just a little while today on being overshadowed. And let's pray, shall we? Father, we just love you so very much. I thank you, Lord, for your word today. God, I just pray that your word might uh, work in our hearts today. Lord, I know that in all of our lives, we're just, God, we're so fallible. We're, we're just so many things in our lives that touch us again and again. And uh, many times we find ourselves in a position where our spirit and our lives, maybe our actions are not what they should be. But Father, we desire, we're here today in church today. We're here in this service. God, that you might overshadow us with the Holy Ghost today. Father, I want your way in my life. I want your spirit to be my spirit. God, I want your thoughts to be my thoughts. I want your actions, Lord, to be my actions. So, Father, today I pray that you will just work in every one of our lives by your word, by the preaching of your word, and by your spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have read this before? Many of you? How, how many have heard it preached before? Like lots of times, right? Every Christmas we come around to this passage of Scripture and, and one way or the other, somebody's going to read it, somebody's going to preach about it, somebody's going to talk about it. And I, it just occurred to me as I was reading this again in preparation uh, for this coming season and I was thinking about it, what an unusual occurrence at the beginning of the book of Luke here. I mean, Luke talks about the life and, and uh, well, of course, he starts with the birth and then through Jesus' life and then, of course, his death at the very end, his resurrection, and then his ascendance into heaven. He talks about that, but at the beginning of the book, at the very first chapter, he talks about this, this meeting that happens. Now, typically... We imagine this meeting when we say an angel appeared to Mary. Uh, immediately, we comes what comes to mind is, of course, the kind of Catholic symbolism of it all, right? And and so we kind of look at it and we think, yeah, an angel came. He was probably glowing. He was in white robes, maybe floating a foot off the floor, and and uh, you know, speaking to her. And but look at the scriptures and what it says. She was not astounded by the individual that was speaking to her. She was not all upset and her mind was all, all worried about the fact that this was a heavenly being that had just appeared to her. This to her, and if you'll notice it, if you read through the Bible, we find that the angels, that when they came, they took on the form of man. So to her, this guy just appeared to her. So maybe she was in the street and she was walking down the street. Maybe she was in her house. Maybe she'd just gotten up from bed, whatever it is. Maybe she was just, just doing whatever it is that she did as a regular part of her life, which I kind of think was happening. And this guy walks up to her and we know it's the angel of the Lord. She has no idea. Because she's just absolutely baffled in her mind by this greeting that says, Oh, Mary, you are highly, highly favored among men. 
And she right away, she was upset by this greeting, trying to uh, figure out what manner of meeting this might, or greeting this might be for her. And, and so she's baffled by all of that. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, I know for some of us, we're a little older, so think back to when you were, say, around 16, 17 years old. Think about this. Some guy walks up to you and says these words. Ladies, can you conceive of what you might think at that time? Now, think about it this way. Think about the impact it's going to have in your life according to Jewish law and custom. And I want you to know, there had to be a large amount of trepidation within Mary about what was about to happen in her life. The fact is, I would venture to say that, that if given a choice, she would rather be pregnant after marriage than before marriage. That would just, you know, I'm maybe a wild guess there, but I would think that that would be the case. She would probably prefer that. And here this man comes up to her and tells her, you are going to have a child without ever having had a relationship with a man. Whoa! Are you kidding me? Listen, man, I don't know what insane asylum you just escaped from. But, listen, there had to be a thousand things going through her mind. This is going to ruin my life. From this point onwards, everybody's going to look at me and think, this is the woman that was pregnant before she got married. And typically in Jewish law, adultery, of course, was, was punished through stoning. Now, there were exceptions because somebody had to bring the accusation and somebody had to, of course, throw the first stone and, and all of that. So, so whether or not, I, you know, the whole business of, you know, doing that, I'm not sure how often that happened, but it did happen. Sure. And so she had to be concerned for her own life. Definitely her life was never going to be the same again. Not ever after this meeting. And, uh, hey, think about Gabriel. You say, well, the angels had no choice. Uh, Yeah, they did. Lucifer backslid, right? So they had a choice about what to do. And here Gabriel is sent down to tell this this young girl that she is going to bear the Messiah, that that God himself is going to come down and be implanted in this girl, and that she's going to have this child grow inside of her, bring, bring to fruition her pregnancy, and have this child, and this child is going to be holy, he's going to be the son of the Most High, this is going to be God wrapped in human flesh, that's going to happen, and Gabriel's thinking, what is going on here? Yeah, yeah. The whole aspect of this conversation in this meeting at times, sometimes makes me just wonder because we read through Scripture so quickly and we accept it so quickly as we should, but sometimes we don't think about what is going on. Joseph uh, won't want me, must have gone through Mary's mind. He's not going to want me after this. And yet she went through all of that. Well, we'll come to that later. So uh, she asked, well, how can these things be? How, will they, how is this going to happen, being as the fact that I am a virgin and I've never known a man? And the angel said to her, he said, well, the Holy Ghost is going to come and it's going to overshadow you and then you're going to conceive. Now, the Bible doesn't, doesn't actually record the overshadowing. Have you noticed that? It just says the Holy Ghost is going to come and overshadow you. And then after what we just read, we find that Mary goes and, and visits with Elizabeth. And we, have, we don't have that meaning about how that happened. But can I tell you, let me, let, me just, let me just define for you the word overshadow so you have an idea of what the angel said to her in the context of the Scripture and the words that were said. So the word overshadow is used, I think, about five times according to my strong concordance in the Bible. Literally means to envelop in a haze of brilliance with preternatural influence. Now, preternatural means that it's something outside of this world, something cosmic, something 
heavenly, something beyond our comprehension, beyond the physical of what we understand. And so uh, that brilliance with preternatural influence uh, was going to come over her. And then it goes on to say in the Strong's Concordance that it seems to have been drawn, or this word seems to have been drawn from the Old Testament word symbolizing the cloud of the immediate presence of God. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. This is what the angel said to her. You're going to have this overwhelming cloud of brilliance that's going to envelop you. It's going to overcome you. And it's going to be all over you. And at that point in time, you will conceive. And this is the almighty presence of God that is going to come into your life. Now in the Old Testament we see that it was used and the, and the, the, the root meaning of the word comes from that first little bit of God's presence where we see that Moses went up on the top of Mount Sinai. And the Bible says that the top of the mountain was, was covered with a cloud and, and for 40 days Moses, at least the second time he went up there, 40 days Moses ascended and, and God told him, I want you to come inside of that cloud and I want to, be, want to be there with you and I'll speak to you. Well, there's some things that happened with, with the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost in Mary's life. There's some things that happened with the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost in our lives. God is able to do some great things whenever that happens. Now, now in Moses' time, nobody else was allowed to even get on the mountain, come close to the mountain. They put a border around the side of the mountain. If anybody touched the mountain, the Bible says that they would die immediately. And so only Moses was able to ascend up and enter into that cloud and be there with God. But in that cloud, think about this. God spoke to Moses. God directed Moses. God gave him what we now term as the Ten Commandments up there on that mountain. God wrote it down in a tablet of stone with his own finger in that mountain or on that mountain when Moses was there. Not only did he give him the Ten Commandments, but he gave him all of their ordinances and laws that they were supposed to abide by. He gave them the, Moses the plans for the tabernacle, which is also a type of our salvation plan as well up there in the mountain. I want you to know, if you want to know the will of God for your life, you want God to give you direction as far as holiness, as far as righteousness, as far as how to live your life, let the Holy Ghost overshadow you. Let it consume you. Let it come into your life. Hey, we do way too much in our own power, in our own ability, in our own thinking, in our own uh, will, in our own power, in our own strength, when we really should be saying, God, overshadow me. Overwhelm me. Come into my life. Give me direction. Hey, too many times I think that we define our righteousness. We define our living for God. Not necessarily by, by the presence of God or what God speaks to us about. But we want to define it by this world's ethics, morals, and direction. And I want you to know something. This world is no friend of God. This world is going a different direction than the church is going. So if you want to define your morality, your integrity, your life, your righteousness, your holiness by this world's standards, I want you to know you're headed in the wrong direction. But if you allow the Holy Ghost to overshadow you, if you allow God to just completely consume your life, I want you to know God's going to give you some very clear direction on how to live your life. Amen. Second time we see this or uh, is uh, a part of me. The first time, actually, I've got these backwards. Um, but the first time that we see this is when that pillar of cloud or that fire uh, appeared to the children of Israel as they were exiting Egypt. And uh, it went before them to lead and guide them. The Bible talks about in the New Testament, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh, right? So, according to Scripture, both Old and New Testament, in the Old Testament, they followed that, that pillar of cloud that went in front of them. Now, I know that it could not come over the children of Israel the way that it did with Moses. I know it couldn't touch them, but it still could lead them in the direction that they should go. And when that pillar of cloud moved, they had to get up 
pack up and they had to begin to follow it as well. So you want God to lead you. You want God to speak to you. You want to know the direction of God for your life. I want you to know, let the Holy Ghost give you that direction. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes we depend too much on our own thoughts regarding these things. And God doesn't have a say in the direction of our lives. I would that all of us today would allow God to be able to direct our lives. Give us the direction that we need. That pillar of cloud or pillar of fire, if it was a pillar of fire by night, led them through the wilderness and didn't lead them after that. Can I give you something for your life? Some, how many of you are going through some difficult times in your life? How many of you are you're just struggling with some things? Because there's some things happening in your life that, uh, that just this is a wilderness experience. This is a difficult time for me. It's an adjustment time. Maybe, maybe things aren't going right with our children or grandchildren. Or maybe things aren't going right in your marriage. Or whatever the case may be. I want you to know that if you will allow the Holy Ghost to do so, it will lead you through the wilderness to the area where God is going to be able to bring you across the Jordan and into the promise that He has given you. How many of you want the promises to be fulfilled? Well, we have a hard time with that interim period, don't we? The promise comes and and we look at time differently than God does and we want God to fulfill His promise right away. Sometimes we question God and say, God, why? I'm doing everything right. Why haven't you answered? Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? And God's saying, okay, I promised it to you. The promises of God are in the Scripture. They are yea and amen. Uh, There is no shadow of turning or changing in me. What I promised you, I will accomplish in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. So the Holy Ghost will lead us through that wilderness experience and into the area where we receive the promises of God. It also did something else for the children of Israel as they left Egypt. They got to the point where they felt like they could not proceed any further And they were stopped by the Red Sea that was in front of them. Yes, I know that eventually, uh, you know, God parted the Red Sea. But there was an interim period of time there where they felt like they couldn't advance anymore. Have you ever felt like that? Like you're just stopped in your Christian growth? Like you're just right there and you can't go forward right now because God hasn't opened the way for you yet? Have you ever felt that? I have felt that many times in my life. And you want to know something? What What the cloud did for them? Because behind them, see, the enemy is always going to be coming after you. Satan's always wanting to turn you away from God. Always wanting to take you back to Egypt or back to this world, if you will. But I want you to know something. That, that Spirit of God, that cloud went in behind them and stymied the enemy so that the Egyptians could not come in and overtake the children of Israel when they were stopped at the Red Sea. Hey, you want your enemies to be confused? The Holy Ghost is going to do that for you. Amen. Get overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. You've been been consumed with some things that are not spiritual, not godly. You know the enemy's trying to tempt you with those things. Hey, get in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is going to confuse the enemy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The word overshadow also uh, was used... uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus went up there and He took three of His disciples with Him. He took Peter and James and John up with Him on the Mount. And, uh, and my wife and I were there. Awesome. <laughs> Not at that time, but since then we were. <laughs> you felt that after climbing the mountain, yes. <laughs> but uh, what a, listen, being there in these places was just awesome. Amen. So here Jesus is up there with his disciples, uh, or three of his disciples, and in the midst of it, the the Bible tells us that the cloud came down and overshadowed them as they were there. And uh, listen, I know that at that time, Peter and James and John are probably wondering about all of this. And I think that also they still considered the fact that this would be a physical kingdom. Jesus' popularity would lead to Him being the king over Israel in a physical sense. And I'm sure they were still thinking that because at the end, even at the Last Supper, they were still arguing about it. But here they are on the mountain, up on the mountain transfiguration, and this cloud comes down and the voice from heaven, this is my beloved Son. 
Hallelujah. Revelation. Tell you something, brothers and sisters, we need revelation in this day and age. So much is being changed and perverted of the Word of God and being watered down and changed. We need the revelation of God in our lives. We need the Holy Ghost to to be able to speak to us clearly enough through the Word of God and by the Word of God that we will understand that, that what we preach is truth and that it is what this world needs to hear. Amen. The Holy Ghost comes and the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost comes and the last one I'm going to use from the Old Testament is at Solomon's temple or the dedication of his temple. And uh, I know that, that when my wife and I went up on top of the mountain when we were there and we went to the Wailing Wall, I don't know what it is. And I know it's, I know it's a Jewish thing to go there and go to the Wailing Wall and, and be able to pray there. But I don't... I, Honest to goodness, with people coming and going, and and uh, and some sitting on put chairs in front of the wall, and they've got the word in front of them, and they're reading the word as they're sitting in front of the wall. Others are up at the wall and they're praying and they're leaning against it. Some with their hands, some with their foreheads, and praying. I don't, I don't know altogether why. But I'll tell you something, there was a power that I felt at that place when I went up to the wall. They had to come and and, and shake me to tell me it was time for us to go because I just kind of lost track of time while I was there. And uh, and so Solomon went and and, uh, when he first built that temple and there we went through the excavation. Hey, quick one, we couldn't take pictures in this one area but the the area where they're talking about the rebuilding of that temple up on the top of the mount there they've already got the all the utensils we saw the the shoe bread and uh the uh what's the other things the uh the altar of incense and then there's the uh the seven candlesticks and all of that they've got all of that built and they're huge i mean but they wouldn't allow us to take any pictures and then they said this and we know where the Ark of the Covenant is, and we will go get it when the temple is built. I was just like, hey, where was I in my sermon there? I just got all carried away and felt the Holy Ghost in that. That was awesome. And uh, anyway, Solomon went and built there, built that temple, and when it was finally finished, David wasn't allowed to build it, but Solomon was. David had... We sometimes wonder, and, and one pastor some wondered why it took him so little time to build the temple and so long of a time to build the king's palace when really in reality David had all of the parts made already he just was it was like putting Lego together for Solomon you know let's just put all the pieces in place and and so when he did that it didn't take him as long as it did to build his own temple but when it was finished what a awesome magnificent edifice it was to God and and so Solomon was there and and the Bible says he sacrificed sheep and oxen without number and I know that in another passage of scripture it numbers them all but the main thing is Solomon did not number them Listen, when we start counting our own sacrifices, it's not a sacrifice anymore or we're doing it for the wrong motivation. Somebody else was keeping track, but Solomon was not keeping track of what he was going to sacrifice to God on that day. And he began to sacrifice and then it says that he was before the temple and he was on a platform and he was on his knees before God in this position before God. And I want you to know the the Bible tells us the power of God came down down there and overshadowed all of them. The priests fell down on their knees. They could not stand to minister because of the power of God in that place. I want you to know that the Holy Ghost and the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost comes in our lives through worship and sacrifice. Through worship and the giving of ourselves to God and the giving uh, sometimes of the things that God has blessed us with. And when that happens, God's presence and the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost can come into all of our lives. So what's the key? The key to all of this, I believe, is in verse 38 of the passage of Scripture that I read to you. Let's stand together as the musicians come, shall we? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Mary hears all of this. 
that is about to happen in her life. She's uh, tossed it around in her mind. She's a little bit upset, according to what the Scripture says, according to the greeting that the angel said when he came to her. But at the end of the passage of Scripture, it says something that is absolutely imperative in all of our lives. And it's where I was leading to with this whole message. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Literally it means that God, Your kingdom is already established, Your will is already established in heaven. The sample of the Lord's Prayer is, Lord, Let your will be accomplished in me. Let it be in me according to your word. Lord, I submit myself to you. I'm your servant. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, Father, I'm yours. I'm yours. James 4 and 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Romans 6.13 says, Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Submit ourselves to God. In that moment, I know... Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I know I quote this a lot. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is the only true form of worship. Worship is not lifting our hands and saying loud words. That probably could be defined better as praise. But worship is coming and kneeling down at an altar and saying, God, here I am, I'm yours. All of me. My thoughts, my heart, my will, my spirit. All of me is yours. And then just stay there until the Holy Ghost overshadows you. Hallelujah. So, I'm going to open up this altar for us to come.